the reconciliation is an ongoing process and the mission, not a final destination, which is depicted by the constant careful revision of our reconciliation action plan and continuous work on it. Pearson College seeks to build relationships with indigenous communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognition, community service, enrollment efforts, and in many, many other ways. Perhaps one of utmost importance is to foster opportunities to learn from each other. So today, as it is an immense honor to welcome Professor Muhammad Yunus, we should keep in mind why all of this is possible. I ask, us, thank you. I ask us to keep gratefulness in our hearts and honesty in our many commendable reconciliation efforts. And I ask us not to forget why we're here today and to honor it. Thank you. So with this in our minds and our hearts, I am beyond glad to introduce Professor Muhammad Yunus. Professor Muhammad Yunus is a Bangladeshi social entrepreneur, banker, economist, and a civil society leader. He is the founder of the Grameen Bank and father of microcredit, an economic movement that has helped to lift millions of families around the world out of poverty. Today, the Grameen Bank has over 8.4 million members and has lent over 12.5 billion US dollars since its inception. In 2006, the Norwegian Nobel Committee jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Peace to Professor Yunus and the Grameen Bank for their efforts to create economic and social development from below. Professor Yunus is the author of the book, A World of Three Zeros, The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, and Zero Net Carbon Emissions. And that is the topic that we will be talking about today or tonight. Professor Yunus, it is an honor to have you here. Please take over as we are all very eager to learn from you. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you and uh, talking to all the young people in Pearson College, which is a very, very well-known college around the world. And uh, I'm very happy that I can uh, share some thoughts with you. Uh, and this would be an occasion to uh, reflect uh, what does it mean to all of us. And I always feel jealous of the young people, like the young people that I'm uh, talking to right now. I feel jealous that because uh, you are the most powerful generation in human history, uh, not because uh, you are smarter than any other generation, uh, even if you are not uh, uh, more smart, but uh, you are equipped with tremendous amount of uh, technology in your hand. No other generation ever in history had so much technology uh, in their hand. That makes enormously, enormously powerful because you can get things done in split seconds, uh, which would have taken uh, years and years. I was just uh, congratulating you as a young generation, young generation, uh, which is unlike all other young generation in this past history. Uh, you are the most powerful generation uh, ever uh, because of the enormous technology in your hand, the technology uh, that you uh, uh, are endowed with uh, without, without when asking for it, it's there for you to use. And that makes you enormously powerful because you can get things done in the split seconds that things uh, would have taken ages and ages in previous generations. So you have a uh, lot more to get done than anybody ever could do in, in the past history. Uh, so once you, are, you understand the power of this technology, then naturally the question comes, uh, what are you going to do with this part? Because if you don't use the part, it will be all wasted away. So you had the power, but you never used it. So this is a good time uh, while you're still young to find out uh, what uh, use you want to make of that. And then concentrate on using that because the time is short. Uh, you have a lot of things to accomplish uh, and you are in a position to accomplish that because of the power that you have. And that makes you uh, somebody very, very uh, remarkable uh, role in, in the entire human history. And also I want to remind you that um, in the very recent history, the entire young generation uh, of any nation were uh, sent to uh, fight wars. So they went to fight wars 
and more than half of them never came back because they just gave the uh, life uh, for uh, the wars which uh, ultimately uh, found uh, not bring too many good things for the country uh, but uh, you have to do it anyway because of the uh, uh, circumstances they are in. So young people sacrificing life for their nations, for their good of the nations and so on. So you are lucky that you don't have to go to the battlefield. Uh, you have uh, the world now, there's no war going on, at least not a world war going on. Uh, so you have plenty of time uh, to concentrate on the thing that uh, you could do without sacrificing your life, but you can sacrifice your time to decide what contribution you want to make to the world. So this is uh, kind of an opportunity for you to think about. It. And I always started in my work uh, with the small questions. So I want to share with it because people say, oh, I want to change the world. This is too big for me. I'm a small guy. Uh, nothing like that. You start uh, with something very small. Uh, my journey began, I was asking the question why banks don't lend money to the poor people. Uh, and they gave me lots of uh, very, uh, very important answers. And the most important answer they could give that, uh, and they rested on it uh, all, that the poor people are not uh, bank worthy, they're not credit worthy. They yeah. cannot take money, pay back, they have no capacity. Oh, okay. So I, I thought about it, is it because they are not capable, they cannot pay back, that's why banks don't lend the money. So I kind of reversed that whole thing by saying that uh, that's not true. Uh, banks should be asking themselves uh, what's wrong with them. And people should tell you uh, that it's not you to blame the people for not being uh, credit worthy or bank worthy. Uh, you should be blamed for not being people worthy because your system is such, you cannot provide the services that are needed to be done. And I reminded them that look, banks are created to lend money to people. That's what the essential purpose of the bank. You do it in such a funny way. You lend money to people who already have lots of money and you don't lend the money who doesn't have any money. I said, this is completely uh, upside down. I said, you should be turning around. I said, you should focus on lending money to the poor people first, those people who don't have money and gradually move up to people who have less money, a little more, a little more and so on, go up. Then they're low priority. But you turn down the turn around the whole priority scheme in a different way, and I started telling them uh, ultimately that the poverty is caused by the system that we created around ourselves, and banking system is one of them, which causes the poverty. And I insisted from that experience, I insisted by saying that poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system we created around ourselves. See, started with a simple question. Now I moved into a bigger uh, conclusion that poverty is not created by the individuals. Poverty is created by the whole system, system that we created around us. So unless you change the system, you cannot address the problems of the poor people because the, it, is, it is imposed, the poverty is imposed on, by, uh, uh, on them by the system itself. So you have to redesign, reorganize, reshape the system so that the people can come out of the Poverty, they are imprisoned uh, because system created barrier for them. They cannot cross the border, cross the wall, and be a normal human being, uh, just like anybody else. So this is the issue that I've been raising, and I gave a sort of an analogy by saying uh, poverty is like something like a, a bonsai. You know, the little bonsai that you grow in your home, at the, in a little flower pot. You have a huge tree. Uh, put into a flower pot and growing a tiny little tree and it looks very cute and call, we call it bonsai. And I uh, raised the question, why this tree did not grow as big as the one that is in the forest? Why suddenly it became such a small little thing, exact replica of the one that we saw in the village, uh, on the forest? My answer is, it's not the fault of the seed of the uh, plant, that we put in the flower pot, that seed is as good as anybody else, but simply we didn't give the seed enough soil to grow as tall as the one that uh, we saw in the forest. It can grow into a giant tree uh, supported by the soil underneath. Uh, so the flower pot doesn't provide that. So I said the poor people are bonsai people. 
there's nothing wrong with the seed. Simply, system doesn't allow them to grow as big as uh, they could be because they, they, they cannot have the root in the soil. So, so that soil uh, is denied because the system doesn't have those institutions which will provide them the support. And financial institution is one of them, and many other things come into it. And that's where the problem. Now, uh, during the pandemic, it's become very clear again. Uh, we've been talking about it. A uh, huge number of people around the world uh, lost their jobs, lost their income, lost their food uh, because of the pandemic. The economy uh, slowed down, the economy shut down, and they lost everything, and they're helpless people. And millions of people uh, suffered to that, still suffering from that. During the same pandemic period, more than $11 trillion worth of uh, uh, new wealth is created at the top layer or a small number of people, super rich people uh, who controls uh, nearly 99% of the wealth in the world. Uh, they gain $11 trillion during the same period. So the period is the same. They're going through the same experience, but the rich people become super rich. Uh, poor people who are closer to the poverty line, they are pressed down. So this is the system which works. It's, it's only shown in a, in a very clear way during the pandemic. But the system does every, uh, the same thing over and over again for the entire period. It's uh, whether pandemic or not pandemic, doesn't matter. So it's, it all works the same way. It just pushes the wealth to the top. Uh, so the few people became uh, wealthy uh, in the world and the bulk of the people remain close to the uh, poverty line and stay there close to it. So this is the situation that the economic system works. So we have to undo that economic system so that the uh, wealth can come down. Uh, wealth can be shared by people. Wealth should not be isolated from people. Today, it is isolated from people. And it's a continuous process of isolation between the people and the wealth. So the real thing that we should be doing, working together, to redesign the system so that wealth and people should live together, not isolated from each other. So this is the direction that we want to go. And that's where the question of uh, uh, the, the uh, question of the situation of a pandemic, where uh, th there are mega problems that we have to face right now. And we see it very vividly. And I've mentioned some of them, at least wealth, wealth concentration. The other one is about the global warming. Global warming is going to destroy us. Uh, we don't have much time. Uh, we are in a suicidal path because of the global warming. And we talk about it, but really don't do much about it. Again, it's a question of uh, uh, how we work. What is the system that works? And that system is creating the global warming. Global warming is not created by some supernatural power, somebody deciding up there somewhere, uh, this is the way the world should go. No. It's our decision, it's an individual decision. And the framework that we have created, the framework we created is based on profit maximization. So profit maximization pushes into the direction of where we do things which is harmful to people. So it's a business which creates the well, uh, creates a global warming. It's not the uh, something natural about the global warming that it has to happen. Uh, no matter what you do. It's not like that. We deliberately create global work. And it leads us now to a suicidal path. And it's almost like uh, I can say uh, that we are uh, in a house which is burning. House means our planet is our home. It's burning. Uh, but inside that house, we are having parties. We are, having, we are enjoying ourselves, uh, celebrating our great successes in businesses, in profit making, in uh, all kinds of things. Uh, so I said, we became so um, kind of uh, immune to the recognition of the realities around us that we cannot even recognize that the house is burning, will not, will not survive any longer. So I said, we have to become aware that the house is burning. Our first task would be to stop the uh, fire before we do anything. And in order to do that, we have to redesign the system that we have, which is based on uh, profit maximization. And that thing came even in my early work that uh, is when I did the micro credit, domain bank and lending to the poor, lending to the poor women and so on. Uh, it happened that uh, I kept mentioning 
that this is a wrong way to do that. Uh, what is happening? Uh, we can create another kind of business, business to solve people's problems. I don't create a growth business, not I'm just talking about it. On the way, I start creating businesses to solve people's problems rather than make personal money. So I created non-dividend businesses to solve human problems. And that's the direction we got, and we call them social business. That's where the idea of social business came in. Uh, and so, so and the natural question that came to my mind, uh, should people be for business or business be for people? Sounds very simple, but very important question to raise. Should people be working for business or business be working for people? Today, whatever business you see is a business, people has to work for the business, so the success of the business, which is profit maximization. So we're all dedicated for profit maximization. Where does the profit grow? Profit goes to the rich and the super rich people. So we are all engaged in that kind of work. Uh, what we did as a social business, we have re reversed that whole thing, like we reversed the banking system. Uh, we reversed the whole thing by saying, no, business should serve the people. So we are here, we are not talking about the profit maximization, we are talking about solving people's problems without any intention of uh, getting any profit for uh, personal gain. So this is the kind of uh, businesses we created, social businesses. I said the whole system is to be redesigned so that we can do it this way and solve the problems that we have see around us. Solutions are there, simply we are not interested in it because we are so uh, kind of uh, uh, engaged in profit maximization, because that's how we're taught in our classroom that profit maximization is solving every problem. No, profit maximization is not solving problem, it's created the problem, it's threatening the existence of our uh, on this planet. Uh, we, we are the most endangered species right now on this planet. Very soon, our story will be over. So all these three I, problems, uh, problem of wealth concentration, as I mentioned, problem of uh, uh, global warming, and the problem of unemployment. Because uh, artificial intelligence is coming and artificial intelligence virtually will take everybody out of jobs. So it will be massive unemployment for everybody. So these are the three issues which are threatening our existence on this planet. So we want to undo that by saying that we want to create a world of three zeros. What are the three zeros? Zero wealth concentration, zero net carbon emission, and zero unemployment. And all this can be accomplished by redesigning the economic system, by bringing entrepreneurship on the top of our uh, uh, design of the economic framework and so on. We are not job seekers, we are job creators, we are entrepreneurs, because conventional economics taught us to look for jobs. Job is the ultimate of human being. That's absolutely wrong thing. Human beings are entrepreneurs, we want to be entrepreneurs. Our schools should be teaching us how to become entrepreneurs. Our system has to be designed so that we can work as an entrepreneur, like the I mean, bank does, like all the microcredit does. Millions and millions of poor women became entrepreneurs with a small amount of money, $100, $200, $500 loans, and that's what they transformed them. They didn't go to any business school, but they became independent uh, entrepreneurs by themselves. So everybody has that capacity. Simply, we are not uh, allowed to think that way. We are only trained to how to get a job and how to get the good job, best job in the best company. That's the only training we got. So we went in the wrong direction. So how to create this world of three zeros? That's a challenge. And in order to encourage them, we are inv inviting all the young people like you to create three zero clubs. Five young people can get together and form a three zero club. And all these three zero clubs are interconnected by uh, networking to the internet and discuss about the ideas, how to create the three zero world. Otherwise, uh, this world will be over. So you will not be fighting the, uh, uh, the conventional war with the guns and the bombs, but you'll be fighting a war to protect this planet by changing the entire system. Unless we change the system, we are on the path to self-destruction. So we don't want to happen, make it happen. And you are the one with the most creative energy and uh, the, all the technology in your hand can make it happen. Go and do it. Thank you very much.
Hello. Or to send a message in the chat for everyone that tuned in online as for questions. The students will have the first run. So please raise your hand. We have a question also in the chat. I will I will read I will read. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes. Hello, my name is Alice Ferguson O'Brien. I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador. And I was wondering what was it that triggered the realization for you that the capitalist system is failing so many people? And like what yeah, like was it a specific event or um something you read or something you saw that helped you realize? what is happening in the world? Actually, I was not reading anything about it because all the thing I did, I thought as a reading the wrong things uh, later on at the time I didn't realize that. And I was blaming myself uh, for going to uh, school to uh, get the degrees in economics. I said economics has uh, made me an empty person. I'm of no use to anybody. Uh, uh, while I see lots of problem around us, uh, around me, poverty, hunger, famine going on while I'm teaching beautiful economic theory in the classroom. Uh, and I feel completely empty. I have no answer to any of the things that I, uh, I see in front of me. Uh, so I, I have learned many things uh, to get my PhD uh, in economics. And that doesn't help me in solving the problem I see just in the, within the reach of my extended hand that uh, I can touch that the problem, the poverty uh, and everything else. Uh, in, in, in Bangladesh at that time, in mid seventies, we are going through big famine, people dying and you see the dead bodies on the street lying around uh, where you are, you, where you, they, you could carry on with their daily life. So that emptiness, uselessness, personally, that uh, what do I do with me? Uh, with these uh, what, empty uh, uh, theories that I have learned, wrong theories that I have learned. Uh, I have to get rid of it. And I have to see how to make things happen on my own. So I started going to the people that's next to the university campus, the, the villages around us, uh, to see uh, if I can be useful to anybody. I just looking for an opportunity to make myself useful to one single person. I know I cannot be useful to the whole village. That capacity I don't have. But can I be useful to one individual? So that's an objective I had every day. I go there, spend hours with them, uh, trying to see I can, if I can make myself useful to one single person, even for one day. That's my mission. And gradually I started finding a little thing here, a little thing there, and started doing that. And I feel very happy that I could be useful to somebody. Uh, and then that uh, can be expanded to the second person, third person. And I picked up another, another problem. I solved the one problem for another person. That me, led me to the loan sharks and the victims of the loan sharks in the village and uh, how they're victimized by lending bill money and in the process take away everything they process. So I said, uh, how to protect these victims of loan sharks? The answer that I came from myself, I said, why don't I just lend the money to the person and tell him, don't go to the loan shark, you come to me. I have the money, I give the money. So if somebody comes to me and I give the money, I have solved the problem of the loan shark for that particular person. At least I have saved one person from the victimization. Then I started doing that. People love that. It's so simple, so easy. They take the money, only thing they have to do, sometimes they to pay back the money and they get it over. There's no conditions, nothing. It's the only condition, you pay me back whenever you can. And people were doing that. And they were happy, I was happy. More and more people were coming in. And it led to many other issues. And it started challenging the banking system. Banking systems designed the wrong way. They lend money to the people who already have the money. They don't lend money to the people who don't have money. And this is a challenge. Bank trying to protect them. No, this is not true. We cannot lend money because they are not credit worthy. Then I raised the question, uh, uh, why do the people accuse you that you are not people worthy? It's not their fault that they're not, uh, they cannot take your money because you say, created a, such a system they can't deal with it. So you redesign the system. The bank says it cannot be done. I said, I have done it. This is the way it works. How did you do it? I said, I reversed the entire system that you killed. You, you lend money to the rich, I lend money to the poor. 
You lend money to men, I lend money to women. You lend money to the city, I lend money to villages. You lend money with collateral, I dismiss the whole idea of collateral. Uh, you lend money for uh, consumption goods, I lend money to business purposes and so on. Uh, so one after another, this thing came and I said, I, I created a business, uh, uh, created a banking system, which is completely reversed of your system. Your system trails the path of uh, making rich people richer and create uh, wealth concentration. All the wealth, 99% of the wealth goes to the handful of people, rich people, and 1% comes to the rest of the 99% of the people. That's a wrong way. So you have to reverse that system. And not only will reverse the system, it has to be a social business. Business, the banking system, which does not go for making super profit, personal profit, or um, uh, maximization of profit, it goes to serve the people. So I raise the question of whether uh, uh, business is for people or people are for business. I said business is for people. So I created the whole concept of social. So one thing led to another. That's the whole idea that I was trying to explain. Thank you for that insightful and detailed answer. Now, I would like to open for more questions. Yes, please. We are getting the mic on. Hey, uh, I'm Or. I'm from Israel and the US. Um, and I had a question. I was wondering um, for us as uh, international students, and especially um, I know many of us here are econ students, how do we then apply this and and you know the presentation that we just heard in our own lives and to make a difference in our own communities? One, uh, since you're uh, you're from the US, uh, there's a program called Grameen America in the United States. Go and uh, Google it, find out what the Grameen America is doing. They lend money to the extremely low-income women in the United States. Uh, this started about 12 years back in New York, Jackson Heights. Now it's spread in 17 major cities uh, in the United States and has about 160,000 uh, women uh, taking loan from Grameen America and paying back and starting their own businesses and so on. Uh, so it's right there. So can you uh, uh, find a way to lend money to uh, uh, several women and so on? Just expe experiment with it. So you have to get into uh, the water, uh, to dip your feet into the water to feel what you can do. It cannot be done in a table, chair and table situation. You have to go with people. Uh, you can make it simple. Can you help somebody to become entrepreneur? Uh, an unemployed person doesn't have any, any job. So I said, okay, I'm going to solve this problem of this one unemployed person. Uh, you can do several ways. How, there are many examples, microcredit is one, you can lend money or you can invest uh, in his business. And we do that uh, instead of loan, we give the investment money from my own pocket and say, when you're successful, you give me back my money. I don't want any share of your profit. Profit just stays with you. All my purpose was to help you become an entrepreneur. And now that you have done it, if you need the second round of money, I'll give you again another chunk of money to you so that you can become expand your business and so on. So you turn it in an unemployed person into an entrepreneur. So say unemployment is a problem. I said, you'll say unemployment is not a problem because it can be overcome by this way because you already gained that experience. Or take uh, a welfare recipient. There is a big welfare program in the United States. They depend uh, on the government dole, government subsidy to receive a check in the, uh, every month so that they can take care of uh, themselves for the whole month. The family can take care of the family. So you can decide that no, my job would be, I decided that I'll take one welfare family out of welfare. That's my ambition. And how to do that? Figure it out. Like uh, I tried to figure out how to stop the victimization of the loan shark and create a micro family. So you create the system where you can take this uh, uh, one family or one person who's dependent on government dog. So no, he's an entrepreneur or she's an entrepreneur. I'll turn her into an entrepreneur. She will be doing things on her own and return the money that I gave her and continue to expand her businesses because now she's in the, uh, in the direction of uh, unleashing her own creative power. So getting an unemployed person, getting a, a welfare person out of welfare is not a rocket science. It's a very simple thing. After all, there's a human being. 
these are not uh, some animal or some, uh, from, the, from the zoo or something. Uh, he or she has the same kind of ambition that you and I have. Uh, so also there is a barrier that he cannot overcome those barriers. Help her to overcome the barrier because banking system will never touch him or touch her in the 100 mile pole, long pole. So they forget about the 100 mile I'll be there within millimeters are available to them. And that's what the Grameen America has done. Grameen America is focused on the bottom most people, bottom most women in all this uh, country. And their repayment record is uh, near 100%. In all this pandemic, all these things, it didn't touch them. That's an amazing thing. So if you look at the list of the cities, maybe one of the city, the city that you live has a Grameen Bank program, if a Grameen uh, America program. If it doesn't, maybe it's a your neighboring city has it. Go and see it. And that's a real learning, not the classroom learning. This is the real people, real object uh, activities. Thank you. Thank you. We have quite a lot of hands up here, which is not unusual for Pearson College, but it seems like you've inspired a lot of question. So Mike, if you will hand the microphone to someone of your choice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Simeon from uh, Belgium. And I was wondering um, to what extent it is realistic to reach uh, such a world with uh, zero net carbon emissions, zero unemployment, and zero poverty. Uh, so in the current situation, so in the current world that we live in, and so what would it take to what would it take us to reach uh, such a situation? Again, this is uh, not a, a gigantic problem. Uh, you, if you translate it into the size of you and me. Uh, actually, I created the problem that I'm describing as the global warming, wealth concentration and unemployment, and you created that. So ultimately, we are responsible as individuals in creating that. In order to create three zero world, your first thing would be, can I be a three zero person? What will make me a three zero person? I don't want to contribute to the global warming. What do I do? I don't use anything uh, which uh, causes global warming. I don't want to use anything which needs a fossil fuel. So this is one that I ride bicycle. I will not ride any car, any bus or anything which has a fossil fuel or electric cars if possible or electric train if possible. Uh, but so I'm not contributing. But the fossil fuel is 86% of the global warming. So if, you, if, you, if I decide, and if I decide to not to use anything related to fossil fuel, then the fossil fuel industry will close. You don't have to demonstrate on the street. You demonstrate with yourself. Uh, so this is a starting point. So 3-0 world means 3-0 person. I'll be a 3-0 person. So that's what the 3-0 club is all about. How much of 3-0 person we can be? Can, I make, can we make our five young people that we are make that happen within us that we will not on the day, day one, we will not be able to zero, but we'll be on the way to zero. So that's most important. Then you decide how to make it possible for me and others, if, uh, 10 people, other people together, uh, and help them explain to them what is possible, what is not possible, and so on. Uh, I will not put my money in a bank which finances a fossil fuel industry. Because fossil fuel, after all, is financed by the banks. And trillions of dollars are financed. While we are talking about the global warming, merrily <coughs> they are putting money in the fossil fuel industry and i'm providing that trillions of dollars bank doesn't have any money that's the funny thing about bank it's my money which is using bank is using so if i ask the question to the bank before i put my dollar into bank account show me demonstrate to me that you don't invest my money in a fossil fuel industry <coughs> if you're persuaded if you have all the documentation, he, the bank doesn't invest in a fossil fuel, only then I'll put them in. Otherwise, you are, you are here, you're demonstrating the global warming and then put the money to increase the global warming. That's the wrong thing. And we talk about plastic, which is causing global warming. <coughs> How to reduce plastic? Destroying the planet. I will not touch anything with plastic. So this is another one. So everything that happens, all the bad things that are happening is originates from me. So go back to yourself and say that it's possible to make that. And me and my friends, me and my colleagues, me and my uh, extended uh, group of uh, support system, 
we'll make it happen. That's where the importance of three zero clubs. You'll come with a very interesting ways of doing that. Learn from each other and make it happen. It's the young generation like you. It's the young generation who can save this planet. Old generation cannot. Old generation has created the problem. So they cannot solve the problem. No matter how much they talk about it, they will have to COP26 and COP27 and COP28. They keep on talking. But the young generation must go out and make it happen. Otherwise, we're done, we're finished. We didn't go to the battlefield, but we failed in saving the planet, protecting the planet. So that would be a big failure, despite all the enormous power that we have in our hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we, as the time is very short and we will take one more question from the students and then we will try to accommodate a question from the online Zoom session. Thank you. Hi, Professor. Um, I'm Patrick. I'm from Hi. China. So you just mentioned that we are actually the most creative um, generation with the technology in our hands. So my concern here is actually here are so many people even in our generation who cannot re reach the education and the technology they should get. So um, how can we actually start to solve this problem in our generation? Do you think we need to do something on the allocation of resources or we should find more new resources to solve the problem? Uh, it's allocation of resources is a big issue uh, to be handled by the governments and so on. I try to bring it down to what I can do. Can I bring technology to the people? And that's the question we raised when we were doing Grameen Bank microcredit in Bangladesh. Uh, at one occasion in the mid 90s, 1990, 95, 90, uh, 96, government of Bangladesh announced they will issue licenses to create new um, telephone company. Because telephone, all telephone companies in the world at that time was owned by government. Government is the only telephone uh, provider. Uh, so to give license to a private company was quite a thrilling news. Then we thought maybe we should apply for a license to create a telephone company. Uh, we had no idea how to create a telephone company, how where to find the money and how to do that, but we applied for the license. And Grameen Bank, uh, we only faith we had that we can do it because uh, we already run a big uh, bank, Grameen Bank, and there are lots of people, not money, lots of people. So we decided that if you get the license, we'll create the company to bring telephone in the hands of the poor women. See, the change comes here. Until license is okay, everybody does that. But we said, once we get the license, we create the company to bring telephone in the hands of the poor women. Everybody was shocked. They don't even know how to read and write. How can they push buttons, numbers? They don't understand numbers. And I answered this question. I said, look, they're poor, but they're not stupid. If they know that if you push this button, by pushing this button brings you money, they will learn these numbers in 10 minutes. There are 10 digits only in the world. You cannot invent the 11th one. So they will learn these 10 digits in 10 minutes if only thing they know that it will bring money for them. Then we got the license finally and it opened up and we provided, we set up the network to bring telephone in the hands of the poor women. And we trained them how to do that and we called them telephone lady. Their business was to make anybody in the village, anybody where she is, wants to make a phone call to anywhere, they have to come to her because she's the only one who has a telephone. Nobody else has a telephone. And she became expert on telephone because she's earning money. So there's a whole group of people running around to. Uh, chaser to make telephone calls to their friends within the country, outside the country. They are in the village, but their sons and uh, acquaintances live in other places. They want to make calls. It became a very successful company. It is still today Grameen Phone. We call it Grameen Phone. Grameen Phone is the largest telephone, com telephone company in the country of Bangladesh. So I was only thing I was saying, you can bring the technology, even the illiterate women in a remote village. If that makes sense to her. So you have to create that sense. So any technology, today you go anywhere in Bangladesh, you cannot find anybody with a telephone. Everybody has a telephone. Even the beggar on the street, he or she has a telephone too. So uh, anybody, anywhere, because it's so cheap, so easy, and everybody, 
kind of no, they know more apps than I would know because I don't use so many things. But they have to do that because they learn everything, how to sell their product, how to contact each people, how to find the market uh, price and so on. It's kind of standing on the phone to connect with each other. So the technology comes because of the need and you provide the system to make it happen. We created a social business to make it happen. And it goes along the way. We created many other things like healthcare services, digital healthcare services, bring, te bring technology to serve health services to the people. Thank you. Now we will sadly move on to the online questions that are posted. And in the interest of time, we will go through two questions at once. So the first question is posted by the president of Pearson College, Mr. Craig Davis. So Professor Yunus, is there one method that might be the most effective in shifting a profit, mo profit motivated economic system? Is it through democratic national politics or is there another more effective method? And then the second question is posted by Itai Klaas, who is a Pearson College year 19 alumni. It says, what is your vision for the future of microfinance and what would sustain the flow of capital and incentivize investors? Thank you. Well, the first one is the profit motive blinds us. We don't see the problems of the people. So if you want to help people, uh, profit motive is not the right direction. So I would advise you to create social business. As in the beginning, I raised the question whether business are for people or people are for business. So if you're a profit motive, people are for your business, for increasing your wealth. That's what the conventional business is all about. I'm turning it around. I said, no, it's not people for business. It's a business for people. So I use that business idea to help people. Like I gave the examples of Grameen Bank. Grameen Bank is not a business to make money for myself. I never thought about it. It's a huge bank. It's a one of the largest bank in the country, but it's not for me to make the money. I made it owned by the borrowers themselves. So they own the bank so that I don't have to take the money. That's a social business. Uh, similarly, Grameen Fund. Grameen Fund is uh, dedicated to solve the problem rather than make money for myself. So that's an, another thing. So these are the kind of things. So profit motive, in, uh, the moment you are profit motive, you are just looking at yourself. You're not looking at people. People are kind of tools for you to help you to bring money. I said the in, in people that you engage in a business to make money are kind of, uh, uh, your um, army of people uh, to collect money for you, to collect profit for you and bring it to you. And you keep the profit and you give a tiny money for them to uh, take care of their family. So that's called salary. So that's not something they can share with the wealth. Wealth is, completely belongs to you. Only they get the salary out of the work, hard work, but they are the one who brought it to you. So I said, I don't want that kind of slavery. Well, so working uh, uh, job, a uh, job is a kind of a new form of a slavery. They work for somebody and I bring everything home from him. He gives me something and I do that. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, uh, I'm uh, hired done for them. I don't want to be hired done. So this is, I want to create a business which is dedicated to solve problems. Like Grameen Bank is dedicated to solve the problem. Uh, like I was saying that the, I create a, venture capital fund, call it social business venture capital fund. Tell the young people in Bangladesh, come with a business idea and come to us. And if you can persuade us that it's a good business, we invest in your business. No papers, nothing. We just invest in your business. Only condition is you return the money when you're uh, within the period that you said you'll do that. And then the uh, job is done. We don't want to share your profit. Profit belongs to you. You just return the money, that investment money that they gave it to you exactly the same amount you give it back to us. That's all, nothing more. Uh, and that's it. And now the young people uh, take this money. We have given uh, over nearly about 80,000 young people, that's investment money, uh, social business investment money to them to return the money and so on. So this is the way I would go. Really. So profit motive way, uh, I have see it because uh, that's the direction it doesn't let me see the problem. I see the opportunity to make money. Seeing problem is something else. So. And the second question that you asked about the MFIs, the microcredit institutions, microcredit has expanded globally, 
one very big. But fundamental question I raised is not just microfinance. Microfinance was a demonstration that it works because banks were saying it cannot work. I demonstrated absolutely answering every single question on the earth that it works. Whatever question you ask, we have a good answer for that. So we satisfied that. But it remained small thing. It never adopted by the banking system. You hear lots of praise about the microcredit, but you don't see any bank doing microcredit. See, they remain isolated because they are focused in making money. Microcredit focus is to change the life of the people. So again, whether business is for people, people are for business. That's the question. So we, uh, what I'm wanting, uh, what I'm demanding, always pleading, change the banking system. Make it a social business banking system. So that they start, if they put their attention to solving problems, all the problems in the world disappear, including the fossil fuel, including the global warming, but they are the ones putting the fuel into it. So if you can redesign the banking system, uh, make it a social business banking system, the whole problem will be solved. All the three problems that we talked about, global warming, unemployment, wealth concentration, all of them, because banks are the vehicle for wealth concentration. Who took all this money to the rich people? It's a bank who took, because banks policy is the more you have, the more you can get. So we are pouring all the money, my money, your money, everybody's money goes to the rich people, to the bank, and they become richer and richer and richer. They say, oh, we are the smartest people. They are not the smartest people. Simply, they are the privileged people because banking system created that privilege for them. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for the extra time that you have given us for the questions. Now, we will use that time with the students and we will ask two final questions from the students again in the same, in the same efficient way that, that we did it the last time. So we will open it to the questions now, yes. And right after Shay, one more can ask a question. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Shay. I was just wondering, how can you ensure that somebody will not exploit the system or never return the money that you loan to them? And yeah. The second, please. Uh, my question is essentially the same as Shay's question. So I'm just wondering, like regarding your idea of, uh, of microcredit, I'm just wondering, like when you first came up with the idea, like have you ever worried about that uh, the poor people are never gonna return the money back? Because yes, you're right that uh, the essential aim of the bank is to lend the money to the poor people. However, if the bank is running out of money to lend, then it, then it still doesn't work. So I'm wondering, like, have you considered the risk of when you're lending the money to the poor people and they're not gonna return the return the money, and then the whole system will be will be like not functioning. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, everything that you said about the risks uh, were there. Uh, I want to bring you back to my own experience. First, I decided, why don't I give the money to the person who's looking for money from the loan shark? If I give the money to him, he doesn't have to go to the loan shark. So that was my immediate attention, to protect him. I was not worrying whether he will actually pay me back. I was hoping that maybe he will find it very exciting option for him. Not only he returned the money to the loan shark, loan sharks will take many more things out of him because of the loan he gave, and that's the loan shark. So he said, this is a good option, but I was not thinking whether he will actually do it uh, because I'm not, I don't have the uh, power of aggression on the big uh, on the on the person who is taking the loan and so on uh, he has to do it on his own i cannot push him to, um, put pressure on him to bring the money back so i knew that this will happen they will take it then the question came are they going to pay back so it's what surprised me they actually started paying back so that was a surprise i didn't expect them to pay back so that encouraged me to give to the second person and the third person because everybody's doing that. Then we saw some people are reluctant or delaying and so on. Can I improve that? How to do that? So gradually trying to improve things so that people help each other to pay back the money. So we form a group of five people in the groups and so on. The whole microfinance system is created out of those taking care of those crises and so on. 
this is this is the system that we built to make sure that the money comes back. And microcredit became known to the rest of the world because it's amazing. It doesn't have any collateral. It gives to the poorest and money comes back. It's not lending money which makes the, makes the news. The payback is the news. It became known to the world because amazing thing, poor people are paying back. Not only they are paying back, they are paying interest on top of it. And enough interest to take care of all the expenses that goes with it. So that microfinance institution become a sustainable institution. So this is not a losing institution. That's what makes it interesting. And I give you the example in the United States and the Grameen America. Every single branch of Grameen America is sustainable. Every single branch. There are uh, 27 branches in 17 cities. Every single branch is sustainable, meaning they cover all the cost of the operation uh, and very high repayment rate, near 100%. So this is record for the last 12 years. You can dig into any, any particular person's record, you can see the same thing. Why did they do it? You can go and talk to them. Why ask me, why do they pay back? Very simple reason. If I pay back, I get more. If I don't pay back, my door is closed. So my option is to keep the door open. In order to keep the door open, I keep give the money back. So, and, and, and this whole community of the borrowers and all the system, and all the details of the system. If you if you can Google it about, the, about the, how the system works, probably you'll get information on that, or you just visit uh, Grameen Bank websites and so on, or Grameen America website, they will give you more examples of that. Where does the money come from? This is the next question. Where does the money come from? Grameen Bank is a bank. What is a bank? Bank is something which takes the money from the depositors, and while they're holding this money, they lend the money out to other people and make money out of that. That's their business. Bank doesn't have its own money. Bank takes the deposit from others and lends the money to others. And in the process, they make the money. The Grameen Bank is a bank. It takes deposit from others and take this money and give it to us. Grameen Bank is entire life, about 45 years now, entire life, never lend out of money. Never. Our problem in Grameen Bank sometimes was we have more money than we can lend out because money is coming faster than we lend out. So that was, we had to expedite our expansion so that we can use the money to lend money to us. So as long as you're a bank, you have no problem. You lend money, whatever deposits you get. You explain to people that to which one you deposit your money, this money will lend it to the poor people. People will feel very good that my money while I'm earning interest, they are lending money to the poor people. So indirectly, I'm benefiting them. Today, banks cannot say that. If you ask what, what you do with their money, they're probably investing in uh, uh, fossil fuel, most probably because they are the biggest, one of the biggest borrowers, trillions of dollars borrow from the banking system. So your money is uh, going to uh, finance the global warming or plastic industry or, uh, or um, uh, fashion industry. Fashion industry itself is a big contributor to global warming. So the dresses I'm wearing or you are wearing may be contributing to the global warming. So have we checked that this is this doesn't contribute? My shirt doesn't contribute to the global warming. So next time I buy a shirt, I want to see the level. Does it contribute to the global warming? So I, I am the one who is responsible for global warming. So why don't I fix myself? That's what I'm saying. We can have a three-zero world provided we can become three zero person, we can become three zero family, we can become three zero community, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you for this, <laughs> this wise closing. And as we come to a close of today's session, I would like to deeply thank everyone that has attended, be it online or in person. And I would like to apologize to everyone that had a question that we didn't have time to address. I'm very grateful and very happy to see alumni from year one tuning in, as well as our current year 48 coming to the session. This just proves that today's discussion is truly an important problem that transcends generations and concerns everyone in all walks of life. I would like to thank everyone who posed the question and helped us get a deeper insight into the topic.
topic at hand. And finally, I'm immensely grateful. Thank you, Professor Muhammad Yunus and his team for coordinating this event and agreeing to work with us to bring value to Pearson College through this. I encourage now everyone to do more reading and research about the 3-0 Club online on their own. And for any questions, contact the Global Affairs team, which has information regarding it. And the notes taken during the event, as well as the answer to the questions, will be sent out to all the participants. And the video recording of this event with a lot of value and information will be made avail available in a timely manner. With this being said, once again, thank you to everyone for coming. And thank you, Mr. Muhammad Yunus. And everyone have the great rest of your day. Thank you.